Hello and welcome to my channel In Search of Wonder. My name is Anne and today I'm going to take you along with me to all of the bookish haunts that I visited in Boston. So I went to as many bookstores and libraries and literary haunts as I could without completely driving my family crazy. So they, they reached their limit. So that includes a total of actually, I wrote three bookstores on my list, but I believe it was actually four plus two libraries plus one and a half ish literary haunt. Let's start with the bookstores on the first day. Um, we went to a bookstore called Commonwealth books. Um, which is, uh, right off of the Freedom Trail area in Boston. So right near the touristy area. Um, it is a quintessential used bookstore tucked into, um, all these historic buildings. And <clears throat> there are old prints and maps that you can purchase there, which is, um, always fun to look at. And they have some really like old and rare editions. Um, the very best ones are like behind um, glass doors with keys and uh, you have to get special permission to look at those. You probably also have to um, demonstrate an ability to pay for said things because I don't think they were very cheap. Fascinating things that they had in that bookstore. Uh, one thing in particular that interested me was a London guide. Like it was a little pocket guidebook to London. And the shop owner said that he's pretty sure it's from the late 1800s because he said for some reason, and this has stumped me in the past. So I'm glad he explained this to me. He said for some reason in the late 1800s, there was this trend among publishers that they did not publish the date in the book, the date that they were publishing it. Before then, there's the date. After then, like 19 something, they started putting the date back in. But there was that time period where um, they didn't print the date for some reason that the book was published. So he said it was probably from the late 1800s. It was $45 and I totally would have gotten it, except that <laughs> I, I kind of was was hoping that it would be would have been like a little earlier, maybe um, like closer to the Regency era. Um, and then for $45, I totally would have bought it. I mean, it was totally worth it, but um, I wasn't in London. I wasn't touring London this time. So I ended up not getting it, but I was very tempted. So um, that was a fun bookstore, but they did not have, I looked, they did not have any works by, um, you know, the famous people who lived in Boston and the Boston area and were published there. Um, they had Make Way for Ducklings, uh, which I suppose I could have bought, but um, I was looking more for like, I wanted maybe a collection of poetry by by Emerson or um, Thoreau or Robert Frost or Phyllis Wheatley or, 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 or. They didn't have anything. Um, I think they had some things by Louisa May Alcott um, they may have had like one copy of Walden by Thoreau, but one for sure, except for the like a little tiny display of Make Way for Ducklings. They didn't have any like special display of Boston authors. And I was like, come on, man, you're like right off, right off the Freedom Trail. You should like the first thing in your bookstore should be a table of local and historic authors. Um, and, and of books and things that are like unique to Boston um, or from Boston. Like, doesn't that make sense? That's what I would do if I owned a bookstore in the heart of the historic area of Boston. That's what I would do, but that was not the case. So um, I didn't end up actually purchasing anything there. Anyway, so then um, later in the day, in the Beacon Hill neighborhood, we went to the um, Beacon Hill Books and Cafe, I believe it's called, um, which was a super cute, like charming bookstore. 
and there was a cafe on the upper floor, I think, or lower, I'm not sure. On one of the floors was a cafe. We didn't go to the cafe. Um, we just went to the, to the bookstore part. And uh, once again, I was expecting a display on like um, local authors. Now they had some copies of the author's work like mixed in with everything else. Um, but they they didn't have and they and then they did have a display of like like picture books of Boston and Boston history and that kind of stuff um but not literature not literature of Boston which is what I was particularly looking for I didn't see it I I looked around I couldn't find it so um anyway but it was such a cute bookstore with um I just love the whole aesthetic of it and with the with the molding on the walls and the wainscoting and um the multiple levels and the little nooks and crannies and the way they had it organized they had a whole end cap sort of display like a whole shelf of um of persephone um books which was really cool and yeah it was just fun to look around there i ended up actually only buying some chocolate they were selling this line of chocolate that is apparently made not very far from me by the way um called open book and they had like four different um, chocolate bars there that were themed on different books. This one is based on Les Miserables and the flavor is white cherry in dark chocolate. So that sounded really good. So I got that one. Oh, I did not. Okay. So the company is in Gaithersburg, Maryland, not super far from me. And it says handcrafted for open book chocolates by River Sea Chocolates, Virginia. So Open Book Chocolates apparently commissions River Sea Chocolates, which is like right near me, to make these chocolates. And oh, that's so cool. I had to go all the way to Boston to find that. Well, anyways, that's what I bought at that bookstore. Much to my family's great delight, when we were walking through the um, Italian area, Little Italy of Boston, um, we happened across this bookstore called I Am Books. And of course I had to pop in. And so we went in, um, it was a fun bookstore. It really had the flavor of its neighborhood. Um, I don't know if you can tell looking at this. First of all, this is like a whole section of books about and by Boston. And I did find some works here by um, the Boston, authors who are connected to Boston, the poets, etc. Um, beautiful copy of Robert Frost, which I had also seen a similar one at um, Beacon Hill Books. But anyway, lots of these are all Italian translation books, um, um, books that were translated from Italian. There were posters there for espresso and pasta and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there was um, a whole section, which you'll see in a second right here, of Italian books, like these are in Italian. Um, so definitely a strong Italian influence in this bookstore set in the heart of Little Italy, and I loved it. The other bookstore that I went to was actually in Concord, um, and right now I can't remember the name of it, but I took a picture of it, so, and um, I walked through that one. That one was a fun bookstore also, and they did have a section of um, regional poets and authors, etc. And I believe they were the ones who actually had a copy of Phyllis Wheatley, which I didn't see anybody else had any of her poetry um, in the regular section or otherwise. And they did have some like locally published authors and they had like local books about Boston and that kind of stuff. So um, it was fun to browse there for a while. I didn't have a great deal of time and I ended up not purchasing anything there, I don't believe. Um, but it was definitely a fun bookstore to browse. So if you are ever in the Concord area, um, go to Louisa May Alcott's house, but also, also there's a lot of historic stuff there that we didn't have time to do, but, um, do the historic stuff in the area, but also go to the bookstore because it's a cute bookstore and nice, nice big bookstore as well. Um, and then of course, you know, there are the bookstores in the gift shop. So, um, Orchard House, which I'll talk about in a minute they had a nice um they had a nice bookstore gift shop and they had like basically every um not every but they had so many editions of little women like i don't know 
30, maybe? Maybe not quite 30, but it was a lot. They had a lot of different editions of Little Women. So you could pick your favorite and purchase it there. Um, and then they had, they also had, I was a little bit disappointed because they didn't have all of Louisa May Alcott's books there. They had a couple of her short story collections and her hospital sketches, which I bought there, um, which I showed in my video earlier this week, if you haven't seen it yet. But, um, so I did buy these there, her hospital sketches and, um, flower fables, which is short stories that she wrote, um, for a friend of the family, um, but they didn't have, and they had like a few copies of Little Men and Joe's Boys. And there may have been like a, a copy of Eight Cousins or something, but I was particularly looking for a copy of Jack and Jill, which is my favorite Alcott story. And I don't actually own it right now. I used to, but I don't. So I was looking for that and I couldn't find it. They didn't have it. They didn't, and they didn't have all of her, her novels that she wrote. So. I was a little bit disappointed in that. And they also didn't have a great deal of nonfiction because I was also looking for a nonfiction book about her. They had one that was interesting, but Alcott in her own time or in her own words or something like that. Um, that was, had a, like a lot of letters and journals and things in it. Uh, but it was like $35 or something. And so I was like, well, I don't really want to spend that much on a book. So, um, I didn't get that one, uh, but I do want to look up and see if that one is available, maybe used or the library that I can get. Um, so they did have a decent sized bookstore there, but mostly what they carried was variations and versions of Little Women and editions of Little Women, which I guess is probably what sells the most for them. But other than that, there wasn't a lot of depth to that particular um, bookstore. More about Orchard House in a minute. Um, I also went to two libraries. One was the Boston Public Library, which, so the entrance that we went into was a pretty cool entrance and it's, the way it's lit at night is really cool. So we went at night and um, I wouldn't have thought to recommend going to a library at night, but this was a really cool library to go to at night. So there's that. Anyway, the main entrance that we went into was the modern side of the building, which was the actual library where, you know, if you want to borrow books, this is where you'll go. Kind of took us a little bit to get our bearings to figure, because I was like, I know that there's like some murals by John Singer Sargent here. And I had seen pictures of some of the architecture. Uh, I was like, I'm not seeing it here. I'm just seeing like library, like this is just a library. Um, so it took us a little bit to figure out that basically it's like two wings. It's like a modern wing and a historic wing. And we were in the modern wing and the modern wing was really cool for a library. Like it has, um, they had a huge, um, room with just like computers that people could use and, um, media and all that kind of stuff. We weren't on the level with books, but then they also had like, there was a cafe there, um, where, you know, a lot of people were eating and everything. So it was really nice library. Uh, but then we finally figured out how to get to the historic wing and you go through this courtyard and the courtyard was amazing. There was like a, um, it was all lit up at night. Um, and then there was like a, a pond in the center with a statue in the center of the pond and, um, and like a little, I guess it was like a, kind of supposed to be like a tea room. Um, there were these tea tables all set around. I don't know where, you got the tea from might have been closed at that point that part of it but there were still some people sitting in the tea tables and reading and stuff um so just absolutely beautiful i felt like i had been transported back into europe somewhere just with the there were like these pillars and it just like it looked like very um like classic italian kind of um architecture just really really beautiful and open air there in that center courtyard um, so then we went into the historic part of the library, which is effectively mostly a museum right now at this point. And they have a bunch of, they have different exhibits and rooms. So we didn't go into all of them. We didn't have time. We got there like half an hour before it closed. And so we really didn't have time to explore as much as I would have liked. So, um, if we go back someday, I will, I would like to go earlier and have more time to explore the different, um, exhibits and collections that they have. Um, 
But what we saw was amazing. Like the main staircase and the murals that are all around it and um, the artwork and the marble, like everything was marble. Absolutely beautiful. And then on the ceiling and in the, in the lobby area on the ceiling, um, they have, um, they have honored the local authors and poets, etc. you know, like Emerson and Thoreau and all like their names are all up there. And, you know, with like different motifs and stuff. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, it wasn't painted. I don't think it was tiles. I think it was tiles. Uh, the tiled ceiling that had all that in that. Um, and then there were different alcoves with with paintings and stuff, just absolutely gorgeous. And then there was this one room we went into um, that had like a tiled or a marble floor, but then just wood paneling and then all of these just beautiful murals um I believe that were by John Singer Sargent just all around the top half um oh just absolutely beautiful beautiful room um so it was it was easily more beautiful to me than the New York Public Library which up to this date would have said may have been the most impressive library I had been to. The Library of Congress is also really beautiful and very impressive. Um, but the Boston Public Library was not as large as either of those, I don't think, but definitely impressive in, in the beauty and the grandeur and the architecture of it. Just stunning. So definitely worth a visit if you go to Boston. And then we went to the um, John F. Kennedy presidential library and museum. And I was a little bit disappointed, to be honest, on a couple of accounts. Uh, first of all, they did not have as much on display of documents related to John F. Kennedy, etc. They they had some of his speeches that were, um, you could see the original typed up copy of his speeches, particularly his inaugural address, which is probably his most famous. Uh, where he said, ask not what you, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I think I butchered it, but along those lines, um, you can see that speech there um, that he read from. And you can see like in red, it's circled like what he changed, um, that he extemporaneously changed when he was giving his speech. Um, and then there are some pages where he um, had doodled during meetings and stuff, which was very interesting. Um, and my sons were impressed by his horrible handwriting that you could barely read it was pretty bad, I have to say. Um, and then there were like, you know, some family pictures and, you know, artifacts and stuff from the family, artifacts from the time period, you know, like um, appliances from that day and um, memorabilia from the campaign trails that he did, the various campaigns that political campaigns that he ran. Um, including, of course, the presidential one and stuff like that. But for being the presidential library and museum, it did not have a lot of like documentation sort of thing like I would have expected. But maybe I just I missed it all. Maybe I just went through too quickly and I didn't see it. There may have been more that I just missed. But um, so it, it wasn't as much of that. It, it was interesting about his life and about his career. Um, but I felt it was missing a little bit in, in the way of that kind of artifact. I would like to have seen more of that. And then um, the other thing was they obviously made a definite choice to avoid addressing his assassination. Like it's like they wanted to focus on his life and his career and his accomplishments as president and then you go through this hallway where they play some videos of his funeral and like they have the date that he died. And then the next room is about his legacy, like what he, you know, accomplished that is still in existence or having an effect today, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like the elephant in the room is completely ignored, completely. So. I was a little disappointed by that choice. I mean, obviously it was a choice they made intentionally and they had a purpose for it and I don't fault anybody for that, but um, I mean, it's kind of a defining 
aspect of his career as president, the fact that he was assassinated and yeah. So I was a little bit disappointed by that, to be honest. Um, they had, they did have a great gift shop with, um, some books and things, uh, I considered, so I, I didn't realize, or maybe, you know, I, I feel like it's one of those things that I, I knew at some point, but because it's not something that, you know, I think about very often, like it just went right back out of my brain. He actually wrote two books and one was about, uh, Germany's re rearmament um, between World War One and World War Two, and how the world kind of ignored it and how like England in particular was just not really paying attention to what Germany was doing and how that led up to World War Two. And then the other one was um, Profiles in Courage, which I know I have heard that title before. But I guess I just when I think JFK, I don't think also author historian, which he was. Um, he was very much interested in history. And he was a writer. He, he he actually wanted to pursue teaching and writing rather than politics. But, you know, we all know how that ended. Anyway, so um, he had written two books. Profiles and Courage seems kind of interesting. Um, but again, very political, which uh, I don't love reading, like, political books. Um, it's not my favorite thing to do. I mean, I have, and I will, but it's not my favorite. Um, but anyways, his book Profiles and Courage seems interesting and they had copies available in the gift shop, which I debated, but I ended up not. I thought, well, maybe I can borrow it from the library or something. So that was the other library that we went to. And so now, um, there are so many literary sites in Boston and the surrounding area that you can go to so many. Um, I just did not have time and my family did not have an inclination to go to all of them. So we, the main one that I really wanted to go to was Orchard House, which was Louisa May Alcott's home for, I think about 20 years. I think it's where they lived the longest of all the different places that they lived in their lives. Her father bought it, um, I think with the help of a loan from Ralph Waldo Emerson, I believe, or Nathaniel Hawthorne, one of them, one of those guys helped him to buy this house. Uh, so there was the house and there was like 20 acres, I think, or 40 acres of orchard. And, um, Bronson Alcott, Louisa's dad was a vegan. And so, uh, his diet actually sounded incredibly unhealthy. Like it was mostly grains, starches, and apples. I don't know how he survived on that, but anyways, he thought apples were the perfect food. So he ate a lot of apples. They bought this, <laughs> this orchard. And, uh, there were some like tenant houses on the property that were, um, like not as nice as the main house, but they basically lifted them from their foundations and rolled them down the hill, the slope on logs and kind of attached them to the main house to make it larger. And that's where the family lived for many years. And um, then also on the property is like an old barn type structure that was his philosophy school that he started. And um, you can go in there as well and they show you a video there and give you a little talk about the, the house. It was very interesting. The tour guide was wonderful, very informative. Um, I learned a lot about uh, Louisa May Alcott, but in particular about her family. Now, obviously the March family in Little Women is based on Louisa's actual family, but it's not biographical in any way. Um, it was just more inspirational for her. And But you can definitely see similarities between the family and her family, her actual family. And so they definitely draw on that as you go through the tour and you get to know all the members of Louisa's family as well as herself. Uh, her oldest sister, who who is Meg in Little Women, um, but really her name was, well, I forget now, wasn't actually Meg. It was a completely different name that I don't remember at the moment. But anyways, that was her older sister. And then Louisa was Joe. And then Beth was Beth. Their their sister was named Elizabeth, and she did die of complications from scarlet fever before they ever moved into this house. Um, I think they were in like it took them a year to get the house livable, and so they had bought the house and they were working on it. And it was during the course of that year that Beth passed away. So she never actually lived in this house. And then um, Amy was actually May. Um, the youngest daughter who was an artist. And I did not realize, like, like I knew that she was an artist. 
Um, but I guess I didn't realize how good of an artist she was. Her artwork is all over the house. And she even drew like on the walls and stuff. And she had a studio, one of the rooms was made into a studio where she taught. Um, people, one of her students that she taught ended up being a sculptor and he sculpted a, um, a bust of Bronson Alcott, which is in the house, but he also sculpted the Lincoln Memorial that's in Washington, DC. That was a student of May Alcott, Louise's sister. I did not know that. That's very impressive. And one of her paintings, um, I did know that she had studied in Europe. Um, I did not know that one of her paintings made it into the Paris Salon, which was a pretty big deal. Um, later on in her life, she was good friends or well acquainted with um, Mary Cassatt, who is an American um, Impressionist painter. And um, kind of the joke between them was that um, Mary Cassatt's work was not accepted in the Paris Salon, but um, May's work was. So she had a piece that was exhibited there, which is hanging in the Alcott, the Orchard House um, today. So um, definitely highly recommend if you're in Boston that you visit the Orchard House. Um, they do a fantastic job. My only complaint was that um, I, everybody was very friendly. Everybody's super informative. I had fun chatting with the tour guide and the, the gift store um, clerk after the, the tour that we took. Um, so fun talking with them. Everything was fantastic. But they there's this video that you watch before you take the tour and Considering that we were a little bit on a time constraint, and I have to imagine that many tourists are, um, it didn't seem the wisest use of time because basically in the video, there's someone who is um, acting the character of Louisa May Alcott, and she takes you on a tour, a virtual tour, a video tour of the house, When you're, which is cool that they have a video of that, but when you're actually about to take an actual tour of the house, it seems superfluous and extraneous and unnecessary when you are thinking, I have X amount of time. I want to, you know, actually see the house, not watch a video about seeing the house. That was my only complaint. Everything else was really fantastic and we really enjoyed it. Um, and just literally down the street from there is Wayside, which um, was owned by, I think it was Nathaniel Hawthorne, pretty sure, uh, him or Emerson, but I think Hawthorne. Um, and also the Alcotts lived there. And then um, Margaret Sydney, I believe, was her pen name. She wrote Five Little Peppers. Um, she also lived in that building. Or maybe Margaret Fuller was also um, someone who lived in that house. Anyway, lots of literary people lived in that house down the street that was called Wayside. So you have Orchard House and then there's Wayside. So I got to take pictures of that. It's not open to the public, generally speaking. I think they open it periodically. Um, but you can take pictures of it. It's right there. So I took some pictures of that. Um, we did not take the time to go um, and see Thoreau's cabin or the place where he wrote Walden, Walden Pond. Um, you can definitely go there. We didn't take the time. And plus it was kind of a day, not very pleasant for that sort of thing um, near there. It, I, if we had gone to Stockbridge, I wanted to drive by Edith Wharton's house, which looks like an amazing house, which one, once again, was not open to the public yet for the season, but you can go on the property and take pictures and it looks like it looked like it would have been an amazing house. But because of the weather, we didn't actually drive out there. Um, so I missed the opportunity, but that would have been another site um, to see. So those are the, um, my, reader visits <laughs> that I um, did in Boston, the bookstores and other literary things that I visited while I was there. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and if you have been to any of them, have any comments or thoughts about them or other places in Boston that are good literary haunts and literary sites to go see. Oh, I know there was one other thing in Boston I wanna mention real quick. Um, and it's really sad that it's not a bookstore anymore. It used to be a bookstore for many years and it's called the Old Corner Bookstore. It was a publishing company and it was a bookstore for many years of its existence. Currently, it's a Chipotle. Why? Why Chipotle? I don't understand, but anyways. Um, I would love to have been there when it was actually a bookstore. Um, but the building is a very old building and was a publishing house that published many of the famous Bostonians' works. Um, 
So it's still cool. It's all along the Freedom Trail. You can take a picture of there um, of that old corner bookstore, which is now at Chipotle. But anyways, that is another cool little spot to walk by, at least if you happen to be in Boston. Another fun literary site is the Make Way for Ducklings art installation in the Public Garden, which you can visit easily. And it features um, the mother duckling and her little ducklings on real Boston cobblestones. And um, obviously based on the book, Make Way for Ducklings by Robert McCloskey. And it is set in Boston. So that's a fun little site to see. So anyway, as I was saying, that was my literary trip to Boston. Leave a note in the comments if there is a place that you also visited that you would recommend people visit if they're in the area and or where you would like to go if you are visiting in Boston. And um, if you've been to any of the places I were, what are your thoughts? And anyways, um, I will see you next time.